Aristides of Athens was an early Christian writer who wrote a letter called the Apology of Aristides to the Roman Emperor Hadrian in about 125 AD in defense of the beliefs and practices of the early 2nd century Christians. There is valid historical evidence to prove that we have the actual apology written by Aristides to the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Robert M. Grant commented on the attestation to Aristides in the Anchor Bible Dictionary, Volume 1, page 382, and I quote, According to Eusebius, both Quadratus and Aristides presented Christian apologies to the Emperor Hadrian at Athens, probably in 125 CE. Aristides was unknown to scholars for many years, though his work survived in at least two fourth century papyri. The Mechatarus of Venice published an Armenian fragment in 1878 and in 1889. J.R. Harris discovered the whole apology in a 7th century Syriac manuscript at St. Catherine's in Sinai. J.A. Robinson immediately found that the Greek apology had been used for a lengthy section of the Greek novel Barlam and Josaphat ascribed to John of Damascus. The text can be reconstructed from the last two witnesses and confirmed by the fragmentary papyri. All we know about Aristides is from his brief written apology to the Roman Emperor Hadrian and from the scanty information written about him from Eusebius, who lived about 200 years after Aristides, and from Jerome, who lived about 300 years after Aristides. Jerome seems to merely repeat the words of Eusebius another 100 years later, so we must assume that Eusebius somehow obtained accurate information about Aristides from oral tradition. Eusebius stated that Aristides, like Justin, who wrote his first apology later, was a Greek philosopher who continued to wear his philosophical garb after becoming a Christian. However, unlike Justin, there is no internal evidence within the apology of Aristides to suggest that Aristides promoted Greek philosophy nor is there any evidence to suggest that Aristides praised Greek philosophy along with Christianity like Justin did later. In his Apology, Aristides clearly denounced the pagan gods of Greek mythology along with the false gods of the barbarians while praising the beliefs and practices of the early Christians. Eusebius, Constantine's 4th century historian, alleged that Aristides delivered his letter to the Emperor Hadrian when he visited Athens about 125 AD. The Apology of Aristides Written to the Emperor Hadrian Aristides wrote in section 1, I say then that God is not born, not made, an ever-abiding nature without beginning and without end, immortal, perfect, and incomprehensible. So Aristides taught that God is not born and not made. And then he goes on to state in the same section, Form he has none, speaking of God. Aristides wrote nothing about an alleged God the Son, who later Trinitarians say preexisted in a pre-incarnate form of God, according to Philippians 2.6. Aristides clearly stated that God is not made, and that God has no form. So if Jesus was a co-equal God the Son beside the Father in the form of God as stated in Philippians 2 6 well then Aristides certainly did not believe this and then Aristides goes on to write in the same section ignorance and forgetfulness are not in his in God's nature for he is altogether wisdom and understanding Aristides states that God is altogether wisdom and understanding. Thus, Aristides links the wisdom and understanding of God personified in Proverbs 8 as an attribute of God himself to be God. Job 12.13 also says, With God is wisdom and strength, counsel and understanding belongs to him. So God's wisdom, his own counsel, his own understanding belongs to God, just like a man's own understanding and counsel and wisdom belongs to himself. 
in like manner in John 1 1 the beginning was the word the word was with God the word was God the word the logos means the expressed thought of God also belongs to God himself just like the wisdom and understanding in which Aristides said is God himself so we see a parallel with John 1 1 and Proverbs chapter 8 to show that God is wisdom and understanding in section 2 Aristides goes on to write the Christians then trace the beginning of their religion from Jesus the Messiah notice how he speaks of the Christians as a whole he's speaking on the behalf of the Christians throughout the Roman Empire to the Emperor Hadrian so the Christians trace the beginning of their religion from Jesus the Messiah and he is named the Son of God Most High and it is said the majority of the Christians said that God came down from heaven and from a Hebrew virgin assumed and clothed himself with flesh and the Son of God lived in a daughter of man notice how Aristides is careful to state that God came down from heaven not a son of God that came down from heaven not a God the Son who came down from heaven uh, not an angel who came down from heaven not Michael the Archangel or some lesser God person but that God himself came down from heaven and from a Hebrew virgin the Virgin Mary assumed and clothed himself with flesh with the body and then he says the Son of God lived in a daughter of man in other words, when the Son of God was conceived within the Virgin, the Son was living in the Virgin Mary. And so God became a man. Aristides says, this is taught in the Gospel itself. And you also, if you will read therein, may perceive the power which belongs to it. This Jesus then was born of the race of the Hebrews, and he had twelve disciples in order that the purpose of his incarnation might in time be accomplished. But he himself was pierced by the Jews, and he died and was buried, and they say that after three days he rose and ascended to heaven. Thereupon these twelve disciples went forth throughout the known parts of the world. Here we find that Aristides gives credence to the historical data not long after Apostle John died that Jesus was pierced. He was crucified. He died and was buried and then he rose three days after his burial and then he ascended up into heaven. Then Aristides gives credence to the twelve apostles going forth throughout the known world to preach the gospel. Then going down to section 13 of his Apology Aristides says, God is one in his nature. A single essence is proper to him, since he is uniform in his nature and in his essence. Notice how that Aristides spoke of God as being only one essence, not more than one essence. Origen and other semi Arians like him later said that the Son has an essence of his own distinct from the father in other words instead of the son being the same homoousius as the father the son had a separate homoousius as a this essence of his own so the later semi arians were teaching that a lesser god the son had an essence of his own whereas the earlier christian witness had taught within about 25 years after the death of the Apostle John about 125 AD that God has only one essence proper to him and he is uniform in his nature and in his essence going down to section 15 but the Christians O King have found the truth as we learn from their writings for they know and trust in God the Creator of heaven and of earth in whom and from whom are all things, to whom there is no other God as companion. Now, uh, according to the earliest Christian witness, there is no lesser God as his companion. Like Jehovah's Witnesses say today that Michael the Archangel is a God under the Father. But according to the earliest Christian witness of Aristides, after the Apostles, Aristides wrote, that God is the creator of heaven and earth in whom and from whom are all things to whom there is no other God as his companion 
from whom they receive commandments, which they engraved upon their minds and observe in hope and expectation of the world which is to come. Wherefore they do not commit adultery, nor fornication, nor bear false witness, nor embezzle what is held in pledge, nor covet what is not theirs. They honor father and mother, and show kindness to those near to them, and whenever they are judges, they judge uprightly. They do not worship idols made in the image of man. Of course, the later Catholic Church makes statues where people actually pray and actually even kiss the feet of some of these statues. And whatsoever they would not that others should do unto them, they do not to others. And of the food which is consecrated to idols, they do not eat, for they are pure. And their oppressors they appease, or comfort, and make them their friends. They do good to their enemies, and their women, O king, are pure as virgins, and their daughters are modest. They probably were modest apparel. And their men keep themselves from every unlawful union and from all uncleanness, in the hope of a recompense to come in the other world, or the other age. Further, if one or other of them have bondmen or bondwomen or children, Notice that the early Roman Empire, they had actually slaves. It was a common thing. So if the Christians possessed slaves as bondmen or bondwomen or children, through love towards these slaves, they persuaded them to become Christians. And when they had done so, they called them brethren without distinction. They do not worship strange gods, and they go their way in all modesty and cheerfulness. Falsehood is not found among them, and they love one another, and from widows they do not turn away their esteem. And they deliver the orphan from him who treats him harshly. And he who has gives to him who has not without boasting. And when they see a stranger, they take him into their homes and rejoice over him as a very brother. For they do not call them brethren after the flesh, but brethren after the spirit and in God. And whenever one of their poor passes from this world, each one of them, according to his ability, gives heed to him and carefully sees to his burial. And if they hear that one of their number is imprisoned or afflicted on account of the name of their Messiah, all of them anxiously minister to his necessity. And if it is possible to redeem him, they set him free. And if there is among them any that is poor and needy, and if they have no spare food, they fast two or three days in order to supply to the needy their lack of food. They observe the precepts of their Messiah with much care, living justly and soberly as the Lord their God commanded them to do. Every morning and every hour they give thanks and praise to God for his loving kindness towards them. And for their food and their drink they offer thanksgiving to him. And if any righteous man among them passes from this world, they rejoice and offer thanks to God. And they escort his body as if he were setting out from one place to another nearby. And when a child has been born to one of them, they give thanks to God. And if moreover it happened to die the child in childhood, they give thanks to God the more as for one who has passed through the world without sin. Aristides wrote, that the earliest Christians believed that little children were not of an age of an accountability for their sins. So they would go to be with God when they die. That's very good to know. And further, if they see that any one of them dies in his ungodliness or in his sins, for him they grieve bitterly and sorrow as for one who goes to meet his doom. Since this testimony is so close to the time of the original apostles, it is very likely that the apostles were teaching the early Christians that the early young children that who died were not culpable for their sins, and that those who were older and died in their sins would be meeting their doom in hell fire. Then in section 16, Aristides goes on to write, such, O king, is the commandment of the law of the Christians, and such is their manner of life. We learned that they alone come near to a knowledge of the truth. Unlike Justin, 
Aristides said nothing about those who followed Greek philosophy as being believers before Christ and having the seed of the implanted word or logos of the Father in them, like Justin wrote about 20 years later. So Aristides says nothing about Greek philosophy as being near or close to the truth, like Justin had just 20 years later. And they do not proclaim in the ears of the multitude the kind of deeds they do, but are careful that no one should notice them. And they conceal their giving just as he who finds a treasure and conceals it. Just like Jesus said, if you do your alms to be seen of men, you have your reward here on earth, but you lose your reward in heaven. And they strive to be righteous as those who expect to behold their Messiah and to receive from him with great glory the promises made concerning them. And as for their words and their precepts, O King, and their glorying in their worship and the hope of earning according to the work of each one of them their recompense, which they look for in another age, the world to come, you may learn about these from their writings. It is enough for us to have shortly informed your majesty concerning the conduct and the truth of the Christians. For great indeed and wonderful is their doctrine to him who will search into it and reflect upon it. And verily, this is a new people, and there is something divine in the midst of them. Then in section 17, Aristides writes, But the Christians are just and good, and the truth is set before their eyes and their spirit is long-suffering. And therefore, though they know the error of these, the Greeks, and are persecuted by them, notice that Aristides wrote nothing about the alleged truth of the Greek philosophers as being worthy for Christians to follow, as Justin did later. So there's no evidence inherent within the book of Aristides, in his apology to the emperor, that Aristides was promoting Greek philosophy as one of the Greek Platonizing fathers. Aristides goes on, though they know the error of these, the Greeks, and are persecuted by them, they bear and endure it, and for the most part they have compassion on them as men who are destitute of knowledge. And on their side they offer prayer that they may repent of their error. And when it happens that one of them has repented, he is ashamed before the Christians of the works which were done by him, and he makes confession to God, saying, I did these things in ignorance, and he purifies his heart, and his sins are forgiven him, because he committed them in ignorance in the former time, when he used to blaspheme and speak evil of the true knowledge of the Christians. And assuredly, the race of the Christians is more blessed than all the men who are upon the face of the earth. Then Aristides concludes his apology by saying, So shall they appear, all humanity, before the awful judgment which through Jesus the Messiah is destined to come upon the whole human race. So Aristides spoke Jesus Christ being God who became a man, manifest in the flesh. He said nothing about Arianism, semi-Arianism, or later Trinitarian theological teaching. He spoke of one God as one essence, and that God was manifest in the flesh of Jesus Christ and became the Son of God. And then he went on to teach the practices and beliefs of the early Christians in a very pure way, just like the scriptures teach. And so I have high regard for Aristides, and I do not believe he was one of the platonizing Greek apologists such as Justin. I don't believe that he was a philosopher after he became a Christian. I think that was falsely attributed to him, but it's possible he could have somehow held on to that title before the emperor. As Paul said, he became all things to all men that he might win the more. So he might have used the term or title philosopher, but he certainly was not a practicing Greek philosopher according to the internal evidence within his apology to Emperor Hadrian. For more videos like this one, subscribe to our new YouTube channel or visit our website at apostolicchristianfaith.com. God bless.